So I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG. Um, a brief bio, I was first licensed in 1973 uh, with a novice call sign of WN6VHV. It was terrible on CW. Um, it made being a novice uh, a little bit more difficult, but now I'm uh, WA6IGR in America when I go there and um, I'm in Israel now. So I have an extra class license both in America and I have the class A license here. Uh, which is about the same thing. Uh, Israel is one of the few countries in the world where if you come to Israel with a, an amateur radio license, um, then as soon as you become a citizen, you can also get uh, an amateur radio license here and they'll apply, you know, essentially apply your credits to the Israeli amateur radio license. Um, I, my major in col college was history. That was because I couldn't do differential equations in the second year of engineering school to save my life. Um, sadly, I probably would have made a pretty good engineer, but, um, but as a history major, my wife says I learned how to write. Um, my vocation is as I'm an entrepreneur. That means that I can't keep a steady job. Um, so I essentially do whatever it takes to, um, to make a living. Um, and I've done a lot of things throughout my career. I've owned a manufacturing company. I used to design uh, electronic uh, uh, radio control systems for um, utility companies. Um, so if you're if you're ever um, skiing down um, the slopes of Keystone at night, then, then the systems there that control the lights is a system that I built um, some 25 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm married. I have two grown children. I have six grandchildren. Um, thank God they're all in Jerusalem. So, uh, so I get to see them every week. Um, it's the best part of life. If you, if you don't have grandchildren yet and you're looking forward to it, encourage your kids to have them because it's much better than, uh, I think being a parent. Um, this is my new, um, QSL card, and I just put it up here to show that um, QSO today has gone in a few directions. Um, it continues to go in a few directions. Okay, so um, the reason that we're even here or that, that people even know who I might be is, is because I started a podcast in 2014 um, to interview ham radio operators. And many of, of you that are I see here on the screen, I've interviewed before, and I've learned more about um, ham radio, I think in the 441 episodes of interviews that I've done than I did in the previous 45 years of being ham. Um, and that is um, surprisingly uh, it, one of the, the amazing things about being a podcast host is you get to, you get to sit with these people. I had an amazing uh, conversation uh, before I went to bed. It's four in the morning here right now, so uh, I haven't been in bed very long. But uh, I had an amazing conversation uh, last night uh, with a ham with Orv Beach, uh, W6BI, about Arden. I learned more about Arden in that hour than I probably would have reading magazine articles and and uh, and looking at YouTube videos. Um, I say I have uh, 441 episodes, almost 500 hours of audio interviews. I think it's probably more than that, but um, I've kind of whittled it down so that it it's not so taxing. Um, the, currently, the the um, the uh, QSO Today podcast is sponsored by commercial and listener sponsors. At the end of March, it will be just listener sponsors. The QSO Today audience, um, its demographic is mostly North American. That makes sense. Um, I have an accent, and that must be the reason that mostly more North Americans listen to the QSO Today podcast. Um, most of us are over 50 years of age who listen. Most of us have been licensed over 30 years. Most of us have the extra class license. Um, it's an interesting demographic because it looks like um, the, the interviews that I'm doing is to people like me and to, um, and to like the people I'm interviewing. So uh, I don't do a lot of, um, I have, I've tried to do um, people in other countries who are not English speakers, but I find that the English um, the, the American ear is not essentially tuned for listening to accents. Accents are hard unless you live in a place where there's lots of accents. So that's why I choose the guests I choose. Um, the, my goals of the podcast have always been to entertain, educate, and inform. 
I, since I have the best time, I assume everybody else is too. Um, and I apologize to all those people that think that that's not true. But um, I have such a great time doing it that um, I always hope that the, the people who are listening also have as good a time about it as I do. I started the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo because of COVID-19. Um, everything was closed uh, at the time in uh, in August 2020 when I uh, when I started the QSO Today Virtual Ham Ex uh, Expo. Literally nothing was happening in the world, and I figured, well, you know, I could do a virtual expo. Anybody can. Uh, and this is um, th this might have been wrongheaded, but that's how it all started. So about the expo, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo was the first. Uh, online, uh, I want. I thought at the time full service convention. It had a. Um, it had an outside lobby. It had a parking lot. It had people walking around outside. They weren't real people, but it was kind of the idea was to kind of give you the feeling that um, maybe you were there. Um, it had an inside lobby. It was really, you know, um, it was unusual for the time, and uh, and and because of that, it attracted twenty five thousand. Uh, participants. And so this is kind of what the uh, the expo looked like. This is the outside lobby. We had, you know, exposition booths. We had a presentation room and we had a big lobby full of people walking around. If you watch the lobby long enough, you've realized that people would, they'd walk forward about 30 feet and then they'd kind of walk forward 30 feet again. It must have been some kind of uh, uh, magic that I wasn't really aware how that worked, but it, it seemed to work. Are we were are are we are still in partnership with the AWRL for the um, for essentially we sh we share um, uh, information about the expo and about AWRL activities. They are great sponsors to work with. Uh, Bob there at the AWRL kind of um, keeps us uh, with our ear to the railroad track, so we actually know what's happening in the ham radio world uh, as far as they're concerned, and um, and we let them know what we're doing, and they um, promote the the uh, expo through their uh, online newsletters. Um, our sponsors to to at to this point now um, are few. Uh, the the expo does not have a lot of um, commercial sponsorship. It did at the very beginning, but the choices now that um, that uh, vendors have across America is something every single weekend. Now that everything is open open back up, uh, so every if all 50 states have uh, state conventions. It seems, and uh, there's uh, there's some kind of ham fest going every weekend. So um, we're we've whittled down to these four. Flex Radio has been an amazing sponsor from the very beginning, and uh, and we appreciate it. And of course, uh, Bruna Bigali and Eric at Prepcom and and Kevin at BioWino uh, continue to uh, help us along um, on the uh, the expo. So the results of doing we've done five expos since August 2020. Um, the expo um, expo. Uh, attendees have come down from the 25,000 at the beginning to about um, 3,000 in September. Uh, that's to be expected since everything has reopened. We hope that we, we have a niche market, and that niche market is um, our, our people that want a, a high concentration of varied presentation content um, given by the um, uh, I think the most interesting hams uh, on the internet. There's a lot of interesting hams, but um, there are interesting hams that come back every time, and uh, and I appreciate it. And I think that the attendees appreciate the the high level and quality of the content. So let me see where are we at now. Oh, and um, and one of the things I try to do with each expo is I try to improve the the um, user experience. So as I said earlier, the first time I came on the Rat Pack was to explain what happened in 2021. And what I what I tried to do in 2021 was is between the first two conventions, I had seen a, a platform called AirMeet. And AirMeet had this um, had these tables that you could uh, you could click on and we would have a Zoom meeting like we're having now, except that we were around a table and you could actually mouse over the chairs and see who's sitting at the table. 
I thought that was very important because maybe you wanted to kind of see as you're kind of floating through the virtual lounge, you wanted to see who's in the lounge and who's sitting at the tables. Well, I this is where um, sometimes I'm overwhelmed by the technology or at least the implications of that technology and um and maybe the effect it might have on my audience well those people that were able to get on the on the air meet uh, platform for the weekend actually had a pretty good time the whole weekend was saved by michelle uh thompson so uh you know my hands all ha, my hat's always been off to michelle because uh, she saved the weekend from the standpoint of of um the majority of the people were able to get on the platform, and the, the and the platform was um, was able to work in its way. Um, but the main platform that I use is a company called VFairs, and they're based out of uh, uh, Carrollton, Texas. On the one hand, on the other hand, their staff is all over the world. The staff I work with is mostly in um, India, Pakistan, and Dubai, uh, and because of the time zone differences. But um, but that's the platform I use, and I've used them from the very beginning. And uh, they are very good about listening to my wish list. And so their their engineers go to work when I say, you know what, I think um, I think V Fair should have round tables, and I think V Fair needs to do this for presentations to make presentations smoother. So every single time we iterate the QSO to the Virtual Ham Expo, we have a new piece of technology deployed on the platform on the vfairs platform that we didn't have before so i'm going to show you some of that uh you know tonight okay next oh so uh, and this is what i'm saying about uh vfairs they're sympathetic they're very sympathetic um they're very good about their roadmap and and including uh including me in their roadmap uh decisions and um each as each Expo is an improvement over the last. Okay, so I, I thought what I'd do is um, in this coming portion, I'd kind of take you actually to the platform and let you see um, what we're what we're doing here. I, let me see here. So first of all, this is our website. So for people that um, don't know where we're at, we're at QSO today hamexpo.com. Um, this is the main page, and I just want to show you some uh, things about this page. We have a countdown timer. So in 15 days, 22 hours and 45 minutes, the expo opens. Um, the, while it says March 25th and 26th, that's UDT. So it actually starts on the 24th at um, 6 p.m. Pacific. The expo has always been on Pacific time and that's because I figured that's the best way to capture North America is to make it convenient for people at both ends. Although I think for people at you know, on the East Coast, uh, it starts at 9 p.m. their time, but hopefully that's uh, before the late night television. Um, Rex Harper, um, W1REX, always comes with, we have live build a thon. So he has um, two hours on Saturday and two hours on Sunday where he's actually building live kits uh, with people. So what ends up happening is uh, people, end, uh, hams end up buying kits from him in advance and they hold them and then they build them with Rex live uh, at the expo. He'll also be coming this time with uh, with uh, uh, two hours each day to build a, actually a full transceiver for uh, 40 meters. Uh, so that's, that's kind of fun. Um, on the website, our presentations are listed here. If you click on presentations, what I've done over the last um, two years is, is I've actually I have a programmer. Um, I've had two programmers, one in Algeria and one in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, programmer is still working with me. Uh, he's, he fortunately is still able to work uh, under the conditions there. Um, it, it's, it's on and off, but he and I have together have, um, we've created th this ability for me to use a product called Airtable. And when somebody applies to be a, a, a pre presenter at the exposition, um, we just, I, 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 they fill out a form, I look at it, I accept the presentation and it automatically builds the website. So this website, it, what you're seeing is real life code running. And um, every time I accept a new uh, presentation, then it puts it up on the, uh, on the screen here. All of these 
presentations are now scheduled. So you can actually go through and see, like, for example, build a simple station and get on the air. That's Rex's thing. And uh, when it starts, PDT and UTC, and its duration is two hours. And then we have a, a little calendar thing that allows you to add it to your Google Calendar or your Outlook Calendar so that um, you can have on your calendar in your time zone uh, what when that uh, presentation is going to begin. So there's a lot of uh, technology that we've developed um, over the last couple of years that's running behind the website to allow us to, um, to put up all of the information. Um, I rewrite a lot of the content that's submitted just um, because it uh, I'm a history major and I had to write and so I have to rewrite um, the speakers if you click on speakers then I also have all their pictures and so you'll see uh, people you know including Anthony up here and again all of these are um, all of these are being rendered live if you click on any of the pictures then you get their um, their background and biography And there's quite a few at this point. In fact, if we look at the presentation list, I'll just put the presentation list up. Um, there's 44. I'll just, and you can see we have a lot of variety. Now, the the idea here is, if I go back to my my slides, is I I thought that you know maybe I should be thematic this time, and um, thematic means that um, I'm thinking about all the new licensees or all the licensees. Of, there's almost 800,000 licensees in America, and um, the majority of those licensees are not on the air, according to the ARRL. Uh, people have taken the test. I may perhaps at a weekend um, get your technician license class. They've taken the test, and then they just haven't, they've disappeared or they haven't gotten on the air. So I, I I thought, well, you know, maybe we should figure out how to create a, a program that would attract them to get an idea that they could be on the air with more than just a Chinese radio on the local repeater where nobody's answering them. And I hear this, I, I listen to the wind system on All Star uh, frequently as I'm working, and I hear these guys come on and maybe people will come back to them and, and they'll, they'll always ask for a signal report. And that's kind of how I, you know, I, how I know um, that they're new, but there's a little bit of frustration uh, I hear. I hear a little bit of frustration on both sides, and I'm thinking, well, maybe what we need to do at the expo is, is we need to invite uh, these hams, people that and friends of theirs, and uh, get this in front of them and show them that there's all kinds of things you can do if you have a technician license, you know, uh, either on 10 meters and above. And so uh, Anthony's doing a, a presentation on everything you can do on 10 meters uh, if you're a technician class license. But there's a there's a huge world of things that you can do um, as a, a technician class licensee before upgrading. And I'm a big believer that the novice experience was probably the best experience for a new ham because it was so limited. You actually had to master uh you had to master radio to some degree. Um, you had to ask for help um, oftentimes. Uh, when, when, when I first got my license, um, uh, like many of you on here, um, the, we, didn't, we weren't using transistorized rigs yet. We were using tube type rigs. And so um, I, I said this on a podcast, I had high voltage in my bedroom. And um, if my parents knew what I was doing, they probably would have shut it down, but they never did. And and neither did any of your parents uh, know what was happening uh, when you're, we had the, the, the lid off of your, uh, your uh, tube type radio. And, uh, and we all seem to live to, to, uh, to talk about it today. Um, but those, but those were great times, but that was also an um, uh, amazing, unique experience. So the idea with the expo and with all of these, presentations is, is we don't have that novice experience anymore, but we do have a, a, an entry class license that has a lot of uh, opportunity for, for learning something in the big tent that is amateur radio now. So that was the idea behind this, the theme this time. Okay, next here. So what's new? Okay, now I'm a, again, I'm a technologist. So 
Um, I, I guess I could, should talk about the benefits, but instead I'm, I, I'm talking about the technology and everyone here that's a technologist will forgive me for that because I think we may do that a lot. Um, we're back to roundtable networking like we had on the 2021, except this, this roundtable networking is now integrated into the vFerris platform. This is a feature request that I asked for that took a couple of years to implement. And, um, and I'll show it to you on the platform itself. Okay, so this is our platform and this is, um, the, the rest of it isn't finished yet. I mean, uh, as we get closer, all of a sudden the graphics change, the, the views change. I'll just show you, this was the lobby in the last expo and, um, and the lobby's changing because we're changing. We're becoming less of an expo and more of an academy. So if you click on the round table lounge up here, it loads. Okay, now this is a, um, graphically, this looks, uh, well, th this is what we call our round table lounge. Every chair, you can pull out the chairs. So you can click on a chair and that will take you to the, um, to the ARRL, for example. No, I'm the only one sitting at this chair. So you can see that, um, let me see. I think I might have a conflict because I'm doing the, I'm doing Zoom at the same time. So I'm not going to bring that up. I'm actually going to block it and leave. But you get the idea is, is that it looks the same as Zoom um, when you come into the room. So you see all of the people tiled. You can change the way the tiles are. It's using a product called Whereby, which is a, a an alternative to Zoom. That is the engine that's running underneath the, the entire vFerris platform. So we've got uh, tables for um, for me, for people to come and complain. We have the ARRL. Uh, we have Flex Radio has two tables. PrepCom has a table. Begali has a table. Um, Rat Pack has a table so that you guys can come and um, enjoy the, the uh, expo. Um, the tables and trade for letting me speak to you tonight. And um, I hope that you'll come and so we can uh, we can um, we can meet. I can actually change the number of seats here. Right now, I, I put 12 up, um, but it'll go up to 20 simultaneous seats. Um, we can reserve seats for specific people. Um, that's possible. And then the rest of the tables are: if a speaker wants to come to a table after their presentation to take more questions, uh, because the um, the room that they used is being used by somebody else, they can come back to the to this lounge and they can speak with people. I've got uh, subject uh, tables, about 10 subject tables, uh, chewing the rag, DX and contesting, HF digital modes, uh, youth and ham radio. So there'll be plenty of subject tables and then there'll be a bunch of blank empty tables below that people can go to and have a conversation. Now, one of the things I liked about AirMeet um, when, when we did it was is I would kind of go through the lounge and I would see who's at the tables. And I ran into people um, that I went to high school with, you know, 50 years ago. And uh, I could just take a seat and, and talk to them. And I thought that was so cool. That was, that's one of the things I like about live shows is if you just go into the lounge and you, you just wander around the tables and sit down, you actually get a chance to talk to people about what they're doing in ham radio and what they're doing in general. And, uh, we have that capability uh, in the expo. So if you're not in a presentation, you can come back to the lounge. Now I've done this kind of deliberately, meaning that I've re reduced the number of venues in the expo um, really down to two so that uh, people will enjoy presentations or enjoy each other's company or go away. So that's the, that's the first thing. Let me see the next thing. Uh, VFairs has finally put our present our, our expo on a mobile application. Now, up to this point, there was no way to actually use a tablet or a or a smartphone unless you're using it on a browser. And of course, it wasn't optimized for the browser. So we now have the expo on a mobile application. So those people that said, well, I'd like really like to come to the expo, but I can't sit next to my computer for the entire weekend. You can take the expo with you on your smartphone or on your tablet. And uh, that portability, we hope, will allow more people to come and listen to the presentations. 
Um, at the moment, the, the mobile application does not uh, work on the roundtables, but it does work on the chat system in, in the expo, which means that that same conferencing system that we're using for the roundtables um, is also available for, for voice, video, and audio chat with anyone on the platform. So you can actually look people up uh, on the app and you can actually contact them through the mobile app uh, to where they're at. So um, we think that that's a, a game changer in terms of making the expo more portable and available to people who might not be able to come because they're not in front of their computer. Um, I keep saying that we keep trying to improve the experience uh, for the presenters. Now we've had everything. We've done uh, the very first time we did everything on Zoom. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't a smooth transition, but this was in August of 2020. Uh, the last couple of times we've been using Restream, which is a service that's kind of was kind of connected to the vFerris platform, uh, but the way that it was working, as uh, Anthony and uh, any of the presenters know, uh, you didn't have exclusive use of the room. It was kind of like you you, you saw the remnants of the person that was there before you. Um, the SQL I/O is a new technology. It's it, it's a it's a, a a company that their technology is embedded in products. And so it's embedded in the vFerris platform, and we have all of the uh, all of the features of Restream that are that are on the platform itself. So every presentation has its own room. That room can be set up a week in advance. Uh, all the videos can be lined up in sequence. Uh, these are all um, requ feature requests that we've been requesting for years, and now they're available. And we hope that this and the audience doesn't have to move in order to do live Q&A. In addition, we can actually, the hosts and moderators can invite people onto the stage to either ask their questions or to be part of the discussion. And so we'll actually see how that works uh, beginning on uh, uh, at the expo, but the presenters will be able to come back the week, come in the week before and be able to um, sandbox their presentation to make sure that it, it all works the way that they want it to. And then in, in addition to that, what happens is, is, is that the system will record the entire presentation and then it will drop the the um, the output of that presentation into our Dropbox so that we can uh, edit the front end. And within 24 hours, we should be able to have the edited presentation back on the expo for replay for the next 30 days. And that's um, something that we're pretty excited about. So uh, going forward, the expo is facing challenges. The challenges are competition. Uh, from other events. Uh, this causes me to, at this point in my life, to decide whether um, it will move forward uh, beyond uh, this point. The, uh, the QSO Today Enterprise has been um, a full-time job for me since the pandemic uh, began. Um, I have this love-hate relationship uh, with it. <laughs> um, it's a lot of work to get there. Um, as everybody knows, um, I'm a an Orthodox Jew, which means that I miss the first um, hours of the expo. I come in usually Pacific time about 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m., uh, depending upon the time of year. And um, and I just have to hope that um, Michelle and Anthony and um, uh, Emanuela, who works for me from Milan, um, and that VFairs has, has pulled it all together and that when I open up my computer, it wasn't like uh, March of 2021 where um, where the world was on fire and uh, my wife was holding my hand for the six hours um, of, of pure hell that that was. Um, so it, it's gotten much better, but I'm just saying that, so the, the love part is I love doing it. I love um, talking to all of you. Um, the uh, the hate part of it is is, is it's very stressful um, up until I actually turn the computer on um, Saturday evening my time and see that the whole thing is still there and that things are happening and uh, this is why my beard is white um, it wasn't my children it's the expo because the, the expo has been one of my children it seems um, the other the other challenges from um, co from competition is is that YouTube content that you guys are making 
um, Anthony is making, um, all of you are putting up, is so good that we've never, in, in the history of ham radio, had a, a resource that iterates as fast and as good as it does. And so I'm willing to concede that while the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is a pretty good resource of, of um, ham radio content, um, ham radio operators across the world are an amazing resource of ham radio content. And that's just um, the way it is. And I, you know, I celebrate it. Um, the platform costs for um, for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo are as much as renting a hotel convention center um, when I do it. It means that um, the ticket is more expensive uh, if there isn't um, commercial support. Um, and there isn't much commercial support except for the the four companies that I outlined. Um, I'm not a good salesman. I used to be a salesman, but I'm too old um, to, to um, have people hang the phone up on me when I call. So I just don't do it. And, and that's probably not a very a good way. Maybe I could find some young, aggressive person to, uh, to sell, but I, I don't do it and I haven't done it. And that's the reason that, um, that there isn't much commercial support for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. So that's why it, it relies on you know, ticket sales. But um, fortunately, VFairs is such a great company that I, for the first time in their history, um, they're doing a revenue share with me based on the number of tickets I'm selling. So uh, that is helping to um, allow me and my wife to sleep at night. Um, after the last expo, I actually had to, um, to dip into savings to, you know, pay off the VFairs bill. Um, this time they're being uh, nicer about it. And so that's kind of what, you know, the, the, where the future is headed. I'll just have to um, see how ticket sales go this time and, um, and how I'm feeling after the expo to see what its future will be. So that's my, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, if you have questions, I'd be I'm delighted uh, to take them. And I'll, I'll turn off this. Uh, did I turn it off? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Eric. What we'll do is Barry will uh, be watching for the uh, the chat. So if you want to put your questions in chat, you're welcome to do that. I'll be watching for people to raise their hand. So if you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand or put it in chat. We'll be happy to uh, let you uh, ask Eric your question. I have one I stored up, Eric, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead because I'm going to um, – is the uh, – csv file available on the website now i couldn't find it it says somewhere that it's going to be there but i don't see it for the schedule. um the csv file for all of the presentations yes so um i'll put that up okay very good okay, okay. we'll go ahead with elizabeth i'm sorry the, the problem i still have um, um people submitting presentations yes so um, so every time I think it's static, all of a sudden I've got a new application. The, pers the person says, oh, for sure I can have it in by the 10th, which is tomorrow. And uh, for sure they're getting their presentations in by the 10th. So uh, I'm not turning away presentations if they're complementary to the list. I I'm sorry, Elizabeth, go ahead. That's okay. What's the new technology you're gonna use this year? Is it, is it that, something so brand the new technology or is, is different... round tables? And I mean, how do you see who's at the table before you get into the room so you don't walk oh, in? Oh, and... can I show my screen again? Yes, go right ahead. Sure. Okay, so let me let me do this. I'm sorry, I had to move things around. Okay, so here's the round tables, Elizabeth. You see them? Uh, so what you do is you're in. You go to the round table lounge at the top. And if you if you go like to ARRL, if you just mouse over the chairs here, here like oh here I'm sitting over here. So you can see by mousing over the chair, you can see that I'm sitting at the chair waiting for people to come and sit with me and um, tell me their life story. I hope they do that, or they'll tell me what problem they're having. So that's that's where I'll be sitting the whole weekend, and uh, people can come and they can take a chair just by. Um, taking just clicking on an empty chair or you can click on the join this table and join the table um, 
if you don't want to click on the chairs. But it, by bouncing over the chairs, you'll actually see the, the name and call sign of the person that's sitting there. Can you make the text 10 times bigger so I can see it on a cell phone, please? Um, the, the round tables are not on the cell phone app. Now, the, the way around that is, is you could log in to the, to the expo using the browser on your cell phone and then go to the tables and see what they look like. But I think what you're only going to see is you'll only see the table itself. You won't see the, you'll see the lounge um, on a cell phone one table at a time. Kind of like if I, if I did this, if I, if I um, squeeze the screen down, you know, so it'll kind of look like this. Does that answer your question? Yes. And Eric, you also it's not said, perfect. It's, Eric, you also said they'll be able to access it directly from the uh, list of participants from the cell phone. Yes, yes. So in the cell phone app, there's a there is a um, a list of attendees. You can actually go in and you can either scroll through the list of attendees, or you can I can let me turn off my share here. Cancel. Did it go off here? Yes. Okay. Um, so you can um, you can go through the list on the cell phone app and scroll through all of the attendees, or you can search by their name or and call sign because we use the call sign is the last name field. So you can put in their call sign and you can go find them. And then uh, once you have their record open, you can actually look at their information if they share information. Uh, because this the the platform the VFairs platform is used for all kinds of things, including like job fairs. So you you can add information that you might want people to have once once you've logged onto the platform. And then once you open that record, then there uh, are buttons for um, sending them chat messages or um, opening up a, a voice call or a video call with them. And if they're there, and you'll actually see if they're on the platform. So you'll see their name, but you'll also see if they're on the platform or they're just registered and haven't come yet. And the and the the app is actually on the internet now, and um, I'll I'm I'll put up the buttons today um, for downloading the app from the uh, iTunes Store or the i yeah I think the iTunes Store and the Android uh, App Store. I've I've added in the chat the link to the Android uh, app. Or the Android app is in the chat. So if anyone wants that, they can grab it from the chat. So it's generic. It's generic VFairs app. But when you put your, your um, email address that you use to register, then it, it knows who you are and it will show you the shows that on VFairs that you have registered for and, and we're upcoming. Heath, you want to go ahead? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, question for you, Eric. The new app, uh, on the day of the event, I had previously signed up to be part of a local event here in Kansas City, a, a women's half marathon. I should be done by noon, which would be, uh, let's see, noon Pacific time is when you're starting. That would be about two in the afternoon here. But if I don't get here in time, would I be able to use the new app? to participate in that round table or actually I'm told yes discussion I'm okay. told yes you might but, be a little bit narrower than you are right if you're on your phone <laughs> yes, but, um, banner, yes <laughs> I, I believe that um, I've been I've been told that you can participate you're the, the speakers are um, they exist on our platform differently meaning that when you go to a presentation that you are a speaker on then when you push the button, you end up in the green room rather than, you know, in the audience. Mm -hmm. So so it'll be rare, very easy for you. And I'll have instructions for you, Keith, and all the other speakers on how that works. And I'll give you the opportunity the week before to sandbox so you can actually try it out and make sure it works. And you can see what the what your green room looks like. Um, if you're doing your own presentation like Anthony's doing, for example, on 10 meters, then uh, Anthony will actually have the ability to go in and uh, decorate his stage and uh, and uh, put his uh, his um, 
video from the library that we've um, that we might have edited slightly uh, in order to make sure that it's clean end to end. And um, he'll be able to pull that out of the library and put that in his uh, presentation preloaded so that when he comes in the day of the presentation, everything will be there. Okay, well, good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to doing that on with uh, you and Bill and and uh, all the other participants. That should be fun that day. It's funny, the uh, the whole idea of these balloons coming up after the China balloon thing uh, came up locally too, about three weeks before the event, before the China balloon showed up. I was asked to do a presentation about APRS uh, up in Leavenworth, Kansas. And I uh, kind of bowed out of that. I really didn't want to talk about APRS. I said, but how about if I come and do my Jurassic pigs de demonstration about high altitude ballooning? And so they said, okay, we'll do that one instead. And and then a couple of weeks later, the China balloon shows up. So it all became very relevant re real quick. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what, what intrigued me about the... Um... What intrigued me about shooting down this balloon, this uh, th this weather balloon, or the China balloon, or whatever it was they shot down, is is the the number of balloons that are in the air every day, and the fact that NORAD doesn't know about these balloons, or you know maybe people aren't talking to each other. That's the first thing. The second thing was, you know, in Alaska, you can't put any payload in the air without pulling a permit. So, uh, not Alaska, in uh, in um, Australia. And um, and you can't operate aeronautical mobile over the UK at all. Meaning that if if you're flying a balloon over the UK, you actually have to geofence it so that it's not transmitting over the UK as it flies over and goes, you know, um, towards Europe. So the, these are the, every country seems to have very interesting ideas on how to handle aeronautical payloads. And I guess the purpose of this presentation or this panel discussion is is um, is what's happening around the world and will this change in America, for example, will it become more restrictive? And that's kind of, um, I've, I've got some other, um, you know, uh, I've got a, a pilot, you know, who seems to know FAA regulations and I've got um, a young man that, um, that spends his, he's working on his PhD and putting these balloons in the air. So um, it, I, I think that we'll have an interesting panel in terms of, of what that discussion is about, but that's really the reason for the discussion is, you know, people are, hams are launching uh, balloons all over the world, and what are the implications um, now as we become more sensitive to the fact that um, that this is happening? And most people, I think, don't realize how many balloons are flying every day and what they're for. So maybe this well, will, you know, be a little bit more informative. Well, you certainly invited the right people, especially uh, Bill Brown, WBADLK. He is the father of high altitude ballooning, as you know, because you've interviewed him. Um, Paul Verheg would have been another excellent speaker. I don't know if he's available or not. He already has his PhD, and his uh, thesis was uh, also using high altitude ballooning as the basis for his thesis. So um, it's an interesting subject, and you're right, uh, they're up there. I think the reason, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here too much, but I think the biggest reason that they didn't they didn't think about the, all the other balloons that were up there is because their radars weren't set that that specific, you know, that tight that they were going to see them. Because uh, we've done these lectures for years at Dayton and uh, various other places, and we you know, people ask that all the time: Doesn't the radar see them? No, the radar didn't see them because they're too small. Radar isn't set that tight that it's going to see them. Now it's set that tight. So now it's a problem, and three ham stations someplace along the line have already lost their balloons for it <laughs> at a cost of $450,000 a shot. Well, so, so, it's so an I, interesting problem. One, one word about that, and then we could all, there's also, I see questions on the, um, on the uh, meeting chat. It, it's my understanding that at, at those altitudes, 60,000 feet, you know, 50,000 feet, you're 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 flying at um, supersonic speeds apparently, and the reason that you can't use a machine gun to shoot them down is is because you're flying faster than the bullets. So that's why they have to use a half a million dollar uh, missile um, because it flies faster than the airplane at that that altitude. So um, you don't want to fly if, into your if, bullets. This is this is what if, I heard anyway. If the, 
if the airplane had done a close pass of the balloon, and I don't mean five feet, I mean fairly close pass of it, the wake of the airplane would have burst the balloon at those altitudes. Those are the Pico balloons that only fly at 40,000 40, to 45,000. Anything above that are the latex balloons, the actual high altitude balloons. They go up to 120,000 feet, even 130,000 feet. And of course, there's wow. no airplane that's going to go up there to shoot them down anyway. And it's a fascinating the, subject. I hope that it's a fascinating it is, panel it is, discussion. I hope so too. Okay, so um, I saw I saw a message. Uh, Dave writes, um, I depend on closed captioning for many of my meetings with colleagues that have various accents. It works quite well. Dave, you know what? We have the ability to do closed captioning on the Expo platform with all of the presentations. Um, there's a technology on VFairs that allows us to also do it in multiple languages. Um, unfortunately for me, and for us, it's multiple thousands of dollars um, to add these features onto the um, to the platform. And so, um, until um, AI gets that much better, um, and it's a, a feature I can work out, it's something that I won't be able to do this time. But the the price of all of these technologies is coming down like a lead balloon, um, no pun intended. And uh, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to close caption in multiple languages. Um, the slides will be available. Yes, if you'd like my slides, I'll, I'll make sure that um, that uh, you guys have them. Um, Do you want to answer oh, Michelle Michelle's asked. question? Yeah, I, I, can I go go ahead, Barry? I was just going to say if you can answer Michelle's question, I think it's a good one. Oh yeah, I'm 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 right there now. She writes, uh, you've seen such a large cross-section of amateur radio world between your podcast and the expo. In your view, is there a subject or aspect of amateur radio that is still missing? In other words, is there anything you'd like to cover that you just haven't been able to yet? Um, what a great question, Michelle. Um, you know what? The uh, I, I, I say it all the time so that people may be sick of it, but you know, amateur radio used to be just a three ring circus, meaning that you had a big circus tent. It had three rings. There was rag chewing, DXing and contesting. And that was it. When we were novices, that was what you could do. You could do it in single sideband AM or CW. You could do RTTY um, uh, in those days. And maybe there was a couple of modes. Now ham radio is this and it has the, the big circus tent. But it has a midway that's much larger with thousands of tents along it, uh, whether it's we're talking Arden like we were last night or we're talking about software defined radio or all the things that we like. Um, I'm, I'm blown away that every time I, I interview somebody, there's something new that they're working on that I hadn't thought of that's a contribution to amateur radio. The Ham Radio Workbench podcast, um, uh, Thomas, um, K, I think K4SWL um, is talking about building a workbench, you know, uh, like a like a um, like a Murphy bed, you know, a Murphy bed workbench. Well, that's a ham radio uh, project because some of us, you know, uh, as we're getting older, have to live in more confined areas, but we still want our workbench. But the but the uh, XYL doesn't want the workbench in the dining room. So I think everything contributes to to ham radio. I hear. Um, a lot of it, and I'm sure there's more of it that I haven't heard about. And when I hear about it, I go, well, why didn't I think of that? And so I think that, um, frankly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited by the fact that we talk like this and that we iterate so fast that I think that there's still a lot of, a lot of ham radio that um, I haven't heard yet. And, uh, and when I hear it, I'll be surprised and hopefully share that surprise on the QSO Today podcast. Was there other questions? I'm trying to read fast here, and I don't have my glasses on, so I'm. Anthony clarified the expo. Is there a Friday night presentation? Okay, so the way that we open the expo on Friday night is 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 that uh, we have two uh, live events, and uh, so the two live events is uh, uh, Rat Pack will be up on. Uh, we'll be meeting on Friday night of the expo, uh, beginning 
at six or seven, depending upon what uh, you guys want to do uh, on the Expo platform. Uh, and also the Ham Radio Workbench open. So Friday night is usually um, two groups getting or two or three groups getting together to um, to essentially uh, make their own presentations, uh, talk to each other, uh, hang out, uh, drink single malt uh, together, but not together. That's that's usually what Friday night's about. The real presentations start uh, Saturday morning. Okay, so that clarifies everything. Thank you. You should come anyway, Barry. It, it'll yeah. be fun. And also, just remember that the tables will be available throughout the entire time. And that's when a lot of the good chatting takes place at the tables when the sessions aren't actually going on. So uh, you can start. Right, and, and you can sit us. at any table. If there's nobody yes. sitting at a table, like the, the Flex Radio people, they, they have to sleep. So... Um, so you can go sit at their table or you can go to you know, at any of the subject tables. I'm hoping that people will sit down by subject because our hope is, is that the hams that are coming that are, you know, that are new hams or trying to get on the air hams or they want that they'll actually sit at a table with an expert that has um, the subject matter content under their belt to be able to talk to them in a nice way about, you know, what they're what they're trying to learn about. So, um, yeah, don't be shy. I think the table's. Again, for me, the, I think the tables is the best part of the expo after the presentations. How long after the expo are the presentations available for viewing? 30 days. Okay. Uh, on the platform. Yes. So as soon as we, we, we we're going to try to turn them over carefully. I think if I do better training this time, um, there won't be 30 minutes of recording of of. Two people got, got they got into the room early. They decided to go live 15 minutes before their presentation. They talked about the weather and everything like that. We find this stuff at the you know when we go and we take them and edit them. We actually have to go review all of these presentations and then um, cut them so that they look good. Now I've I've put up a YouTube channel and so those presentations will find them find their way to the YouTube channel. But I now have over 400 of these presentations. So um, it takes uh, me and Ben a long time to kind of get them, which we try to do, you know, a, a one a day. Um, if life gets in the way, it's a few a week. But there's a lot of content that's it's finding its way to the to YouTube. And then depending upon how this all goes, uh, uh, will also depend upon where those presentations at, at some point. I think the um, uh, the Internet Archive will end up with, you know, everything that's QSO today so that when I'm under the turf, uh, there will still be people, uh, there will still be presentations for people to enjoy, uh, you know, long after I'm gone. If anyone else has any questions, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. We'll be happy to acknowledge you and I'll let you ask your questions. and directly well it's, 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 it's good that you can watch them afterwards but sometimes there are two presentations that you want to see and they're almost always scheduled at the exact same time so you can go to one and watch the other one later right so barry um the way this sql system works is is, is that and it depends on how we program it um usually as soon as the presentation is made then the original presentation is available for replay. It may not have the live Q and A that was that followed, because we have to render that video and then kind of put it back up. So, um, so as soon as as soon as a presentation plays, uh, you know, plays in its schedule, what we're doing is uh, just for the for background, all of the presentations, with the except, exception of the of the um, Buildathons and the panel discussions, everything is pre-recorded, and we we I started doing that at the very beginning because um, with COVID we weren't sure whether or not our guest was our presenter was actually going to show up, and we actually had a, a a couple of guests that ended up doing their live Q and A using their phones from um, from emergency rooms and hospitals using the hospital Wi-Fi, so. The, the idea then is so we get the best quality uh, presentation, we have them pre-recorded and almost all those presentations now have been uploaded 
um, to, uh, to our Dropbox and we're editing them now, meaning that we're making sure that they're branded properly, that they're any, you know, some, some of the presenters are not video editors. So uh, we, we kind of go through them and make sure that they're good enough to go up on the platform. So when, we, when you see a presentation, the presentation that you see has been pre-recorded in advance. And then as soon as it's over, then the presenter comes on with the moderator, you know, like we're doing now, and we take live, live questions. All of that is getting recorded. So you'll have the presentations for the ones that you didn't see right afterwards that you can you can um, play on the platform. And then a day or so later, um, I'll, we'll actually swap those out with the ones that have the live question and answers. And that will be the final product that will end up hopefully on our YouTube channel at some point beyond the expo, but at least there for the 30 days. And we're going to chat, Anthony. Yes. Any other questions? Please raise your hand. Will anyone would like to ask questions directly? Well, thank you very much, Eric. We really appreciate it. We appreciate getting the chance to speak on Friday. We'll be happy to uh, to greet all of you on Friday evening when we start up, and uh, we'll be at trying to have someone throughout the the uh the qso today at one of the tables uh, i tend to hang out through as much as i can during the night that's that's a great time to meet people so uh we will have people there so stop by the rat pack and uh we really look forward to the expo uh just a couple right if you have any problems getting on board on the expo um you can there's a uh, on the upper right hand corner of the expo screen is the um, support email and it's it's something like qso today at v fairs uh whatever but that goes to my team um at v fairs uh who are as i said they're in dubai uh they're in pakistan and they're in india they're amazing people they're they've been um uh, amazing support uh, for me, they will they will answer your questions and try to get you on board if there's any onboarding problems. Um, Emanuela will be there when we open, but Emanu uh, Emanuela is in Milan, so it'll be the middle of the night for her, but she'll kind of hold it all together until I arrive um, the next day. And um, and as I say, I'll be at the uh, I'll be at the QSO today table and happy to talk to you uh, if you have any support questions and um, that's kind of how it'll work thank you thank you very much anthony thank you uh, rat pack for having me um you're very kind i appreciate it well thank you very much eric we really look forward to the to the expo just a couple quick words for the rest of you out there uh if you are not uh familiar with our website ratpack.us r-a-t-p-a-c.us and uh you may also want to consider joining one of the mailing list available that way you'll get notifications of upcoming rat pack sessions also if you follow us on youtube you can you can become a subscriber follow us on twitter and you'll get twitter notifications of upcoming sessions and you will also get notices of recorded sessions that are available if you go to our uh our uh, tiny dot cc slash rat pack dash list you will get this list that you see on the screen here you can also go in and choose to get a notification of that and it'll allow you to get a notification when we post the videos you'll get a notification immediately that the uh, schedule has been changed and you'll have that information so again ratpack.us i'll put it in the chat you can just click on it from there and uh that'll take you to the our web page also please if you would uh let your friends fellow hams know about rat pack we'd love to uh have them join us on wednesdays and thursdays nights <laughs>